I again call on Congress to pass the assault weapons ban. Pass it. It should not be a partisan issue. It's a common sense issue. We have to act now. People say, why do I keep saying this if it's not happening? Because I want you to know who isn't doing it, who isn't helping to put pressure on them. Do you think there's any role for Congress to play to, in reaction to this tragedy? Obviously, this is your state now, but sure. it's happened in every other state. Oh, it's happening. Well. It doesn't matter what state it's happened in. It's we're all Americans. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. And they all believe red, it's, and they're believing a lot. Um, I, I don't see any real role that we could do other than mess things up, honestly. ATF's uh, mission is pretty simple. It's to protect the American public from firearms violence and violent crime. And that means the horrible things that you talked about in Aurora, the things we've seen in Uvalde and, and Buffalo and Tree of Life in Pittsburgh uh, and Highland Park, but it also means, as you said, uh, the tragedies that happen to hundreds of families every week, every day more than 100 families lose somebody in this country because of firearms violence. Good afternoon, I'm Leanne Caldwell. I'm an anchor of Washington Post Live, also co-author of the Early 202 newsletter. Today, we have a fascinating program. We are speaking with alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives director, Steve Dettelbeck. Steve, director, thank you so much for your time today and joining us. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, so in the opening, we saw, we heard you explain that the role of the ATF is to uh, protect Americans from violent crime. Can you explain how the ATF does that, what their mission is, how they're trying to protect people? All right, so uh, great question. Here's the frame that ATF works in every day the people here work in every day. So the frame that ATF works in every day is we're a small agency. So we have uh, something like uh, 5,000 or a little bit more people. And of those only about 2,500 of those people are badge carrying, gun carrying agents, about 800 uh, investigators in addition to that. New York City Police Department alone so New York City has uh, something like 36,000 sworn officers. Uh, so you can see a very small agency with a huge problem, which is violent crime, gun crime in the United States of America. Um, and so uh, what does that mean for the men and women of ATF? It means our strategy has to acknowledge that frame, that reality. So two things. First, we have to partner uh, with law enforcement organizations other than ourselves, right? It's too big of a problem for one small agency to resolve on its own. So we double and triple and quadruple down on partnering with state, local, federal, tribal law enforcement agencies all around the country. We serve on task forces. We work together in local communities. We stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with, with those officials, those law enforcement agencies to try and fight violent crime in their communities. The second thing it means is we have to, to bring something to the table uh, as ATF that helps in those communities. And we are the, the nation's experts on firearms, uh, on arsons and explosives also, but talking here today on firearms, and we bring that expertise to those partnerships. And specifically right now, uh, the sort of the thing that we are bringing, which is so helpful, is something called crime gun intelligence. Uh, now, crime gun intelligence sounds uh, mysterious, but it's not. Crime gun intelligence is, a, is, is talking about the fact that when there's a crime gun, a gun associated with an actual crime, a shooting, um, that we are doing everything we can at ATF to squeeze every bit of evidence we can out of that crime gun, right? Every, from the outside of the firearm, right? From the inside of the firearm, from what comes out the front of the firearm, the bullet, and what's expelled out the back, uh, the expended cartridge casing. Um, that means two major things right now, but there's some others. The two major ones are uh, the NIBIN system, which is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, um, 
which basically is able to now match the cartridge casings that are expended out of the back of the firearm to come up with what is basically a criminal history of a crime gun. We can link that crime gun to all the other crimes that it's been involved with uh, in a community across the country. The other big part of crime gun intelligence we have right now is the, the tracing, the e-tracing that we provide to every crime gun in the United States. Now that's the best example of that uh, is the uh, Highland Park 4th of July massacre, where we working with our state and local law enforcement partners were able to trace that firearm in hours uh, to its first retail sale and help locals to identify and catch the shooter before that person uh, killed again. And what I would say is that people say, well, oh, that's just dealing with things after the fact. Almost all the evidence crime in, in crime analysis shows that this many people commit crimes, right? But a much smaller group are shooters, trigger pullers. Mm -hmm. and, and those individuals tend to do it more than once. So we can interrupt the shooting cycle and help our local partners to get those trigger pullers off the streets. So that's a, a long answer, I'm sorry, but that's some of the things we're doing at ATF to really focus on this problem. No, it's a really great answer. And so I just want to follow up on that because that's after, what you explained is after a crime has been committed, you said some say, well, that's reactionary. What about the tracing of guns before a crime is committed? Just regular buyers, people who have no intention of committing a crime. Does ATF have a role there? So so in the United States, ATF, the role we have is defined by the statutes that Congress passes, the laws that Congress passes. Uh, there is a law now that makes it unlawful to have a firearms registry in the United States. Uh, and our tracing is limited by law uh, to crime guns. So to answer your question, the law which we in law enforcement take as it's given to us and follow uh, talks about focusing on crime guns. Um, mm -hmm. We do do other things though, besides the two things I told you. One of the things we do is we uh, have responsibility uh, to, uh, to implement the statutes as Congress passes them. Uh, that means, for instance, making sure that the firearms dealers in the United States across the country are actually following the rules. Now, the vast majority, I will tell you, of federal firearms licensees do obey the, the, the rules, and, but there are some that don't. Uh, and by inspecting those uh, firearms dealers, by holding them accountable uh, for their actions, and in extreme cases, uh, bringing actions to revoke their licenses. We also hope up, up front to prevent firearms from moving from lawful commerce to unlawful firearms trafficking. And that's part of any strategy on this has to start with trying to slow down the movement of firearms from the lawful side to the unlawful side. Is Congress prohibiting some of the things that ATF can and should be doing to prevent gun violence? Look, um, we're in law enforcement at ATF. And, uh, you know, the administration, the president, uh, the attorney general uh, have been very vocal about some of the measures that, that, that uh, need to be passed. But at ATF, our job is to take what comes out of that debate and make sure we're squeezing every last bit uh, of law enforcement ability out of it. So for instance, last year, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. In that law were two brand new criminal division, uh, uh, provisions. One of them was the first ever standalone crime on the federal side for what's called straw purchasing. Now, the straw purchasing is where one person buys a gun for somebody else. And many times that's a person that isn't allowed to buy it themselves or is gonna commit a crime with it and they don't want it to be traced back to them. So now there is a standalone crime. We're bringing cases to prevent straw purchasing or punish it. Uh, another thing they did is that the first ever firearms trafficking crime on the federal side, a standalone crime was passed and we are doing things to try and investigate and prosecute those cases. So. 
Congress gives us something, we implement it. Uh, but there is a huge debate, as you know, a huge debate in this country over what things Congress should and shouldn't pass. The ATF, our job is to take what comes out of that debate and put it to use. So there's some in Congress, some Republicans who want to eliminate the ATF. There's been efforts to uh, the successful efforts to underfund ATF over the year. As we mentioned in our out our intro, you are the first confirmed ATF director since 2015. And that was an attempt to weaken the agency by not putting in place a confirmed director. Um, so what are, do you think that the agency is adequately funded and are you feeling pressure from a Republican controlled House of Representatives uh, to to scale back your work? So we're not going to be pressured by anybody in any side of whatever debate, right? We're a law enforcement agency. We're going to do what law enforcement agencies do. We're going to get out there and we're not going to be political. We're going to deliver the mail. We're going to do what we have to do to try to protect the American people with the tools and resources we have. Uh, look, the, the in terms of our budget, I don't think there's a law enforcement executive in the United States uh, and probably in the world who would tell you that they couldn't do more if they had more resources. And President Biden has been very aggressive uh, about asking for more resources uh, for ATF repeatedly from the Congress. Uh, and uh, we have gotten some more resources in the past. Uh, and I am hopeful uh, that people will understand that the work we do is not partisan. It is law enforcement work designed to protect the American people from violent crime. Um, look, I, I, uh, you're right. I'm the first confirmed director in quite a while. Uh, and when you come in, I will tell you something. You know, I see the men and women who work here. They're not political people. The men and women who work here, it's really incredibly impressive. They are running towards gunfire. They respond to every mass shooting. They deal with gangs. They go through doors on search warrants in incredibly dangerous situations every day. They work hard to inspect uh, firearms dealers. They, they run DNA tests that solve mass murders. Um, you name it. Uh, they're incredibly dedicated, brave public servants uh, and law enforcement uh, people. And, uh, you know, it's my job to try and do for them and get for them everything they deserve in terms of resources uh, and respect uh, because they've earned it. There's a rule that ATF has uh, implemented that's expected to go into effect at the end of May on pistol braces. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee has called you to testify before their committee in April to uh, on a restriction on p pistol braces. Um, and as we know, last week, they were going to hold a markup on their bill, but it was the day after that horrific Nashville shooting at the Covenant School. And so they canceled it. Do you plan to maintain moving forward with restrictions on pistol braces? Uh, so um, in 1934, the Congress of the United States passed the National Firearms Act. We didn't pass it, Congress passed it. And it has some increased restrictions on short barreled rifles, among some other weapons. Congress actually said, the words they used were, Congress's words, not mine, that short barreled rifles were, quote, unusually dangerous, end quote. Uh, and we've seen that that's not something from the 30s, right? The, 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 uh, the mass shooting uh, in Dayton. Uh, the uh, Boulder, Colorado uh, Q nightclub. Um, uh, although I don't know about the length of the firearm from the pictures, it appears there was a stabilizing brace on one of the weapons used in Tennessee last week. Uh, uh, so these, it's up to ATF to implement that law. Um, and all the rule says is that if you take a, a if you have a short barreled rifle, but you're not uh, buying it as a short barreled rifle, you're buying in two pieces and you're sticking the, the, the back, the brace on to be shouldered like a short barreled rifle, uh, that you have to obey the same rules as people who sell the short barreled rifle or, or buy the short barreled rifle uh, when it's in one piece. So everybody plays by the same statutory rules. It's in a statute. That's what this says. And by the way, there's no tax that we, we, we waived the tax because some people said, well, it's been confusing in the past. 
uh, about whether this was covered or not by the National Firearms Act, because if ATF has said some things, I don't have to get into the history of that. This is under litigation, so I'm limited in what I can say. Um, but uh, uh, you know, we are doing our best, as I said, to implement the laws as Congress has passed them. Director, why is there so much gun violence in this country? Well, first of all, let me just start by repeating the premise of the question. There is a lot of gun violence in this country, right? And and one of the things I get a little nervous about, uh, actually I'm scared of, is that somehow that people will come to accept it, that this level of gun violence in the United States of America is kind of part of being, it's who we are as Americans, part of our culture. Uh, it is not. It is wholly un-American. This level of gun violence in our country is wholly un-American. Um, and we need to say that repeatedly. It's not um, part of our national story that people are afraid to send their kids to school. It's not part of our national story that people can't sit out on their porch in certain neighborhoods in this country. It's not who we are as Americans that you can't go to a movie or a rock concert or church uh, without being scared. Uh, so we need to say that. Uh, that's number one and call that out for what it is. It, it's not acceptable to ATF. It's not acceptable to our law enforcement partners and it shouldn't be acceptable to the American people. As to why we have this level of gun violence, uh, again, you know, I, uh, there are a lot of different reasons. And many of the things that are causing this violence are things we've talked about already, right? The diversion of firearms from lawful commerce to unlawful commerce. Things in the Bipartisan Saver Communities Act had a great deal of money for mental health in that, that act, right? Uh, dealing with things like, uh, things in that act to perhaps fund red flag laws. You know, anybody who tells you that no one of those things is going to change it, it fix the gun violence problem, they're probably right. But that is not an excuse not to do anything, right? To me, that's a call to action to do more. Um, uh, yeah. But the policymakers will decide that it's not any one cause. It's a it's a it's a whole range of causes that are come together, which means we have to deal with all of them, not to just yeah. you know let it go and say oh it's just it's unstoppable now we just can't we just can't it's too hard of a problem. Mm -hmm. President Biden has repeatedly called for an assault weapons ban. He does this after every high profile mass shooting. Do you agree with him? Well, I'm a member of the administration. I agree with the position of the president, uh, the attorney general. Uh, it will be up to Congress, of course, as the president has said, uh, to to decide uh, uh, whether to act on that. Uh, you know, and the reason I, I, he calls for these things is because um, he's seeing what's happening into real Americans, and he, he again just believes that we haven't done enough yet. Uh, and he's right about that. We haven't done enough yet. There's a lot of different measures that we need to think about and, and debate and decide which ones we can adopt and then send them to us and we'll implement them. That's our job at ATF, mm -hmm. not, to, not, to, not to make the decisions, but to implement them. Yeah. Uh, the Washington Post did a phenomenal series in, um, that was published in the past couple of weeks on uh, an assault weapon, the AR-15 and similar guns. And one of the things that my colleagues at the Post did was showed what a bullet from this type of weapon does to the human body. And we're gonna show you a video, but first I wanna warn our audience that even though it is an animation, it could still be very troubling. Um, but let's take a look at this and we'll talk on the other side. And and this is obviously an adult uh, body, not even a child, children body, um, which where the damage is even worse. So what role do you think can high capacity bans play in violence reduction? And would that be an effective tool? 
first, let me just say, you know, when I see things like that, you know, everywhere I go, and I've been all over the country, I, I sit down and I try to hear from victims and survivors and their families, violent crime, you know, uh, uh, they don't look at animations, they deal with the horrible realities. Uh, as a father, uh, you know, as a husband, as an American, I, it, it just is unspeakable uh, what so many people have to deal with uh, and unacceptable. Uh, and look, I mean, there are, as I said before, uh, uh, you know, the president has been very clear. The administration has been clear on this. Uh, uh, you know, and there, as I also said before, there are a lot of different measures uh, that we need to take to try to deal with firearm violence in the United States of America. Uh, so, so you know, uh, I don't, I don't know what to say. It's a horrible situation, and these we're we're the firearms experts, right, at ATF, so we know when that many different kinds of firearms cause damage. So, you know, the, the most common uh, firearm used in, in violent crime is of course, uh, handguns. Uh, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons I think that the, the president also recently called for us as, as a government under the current law to try to make sure that we are doing all we can to run background checks uh, under the current law on individuals so that we can prevent individuals who everybody in the law says shouldn't have firearms from having them. Uh, uh, it's just a horrible problem. You previously said that you support an assault weapons ban in just a couple minutes ago. Um, but there are some people, there's a lot of people around the country who own these weapons. Let's hear from one person who decided to purchase an AR-15. Growing up in the South, uh, surely uh, the white supremacy issue is no new thing for me. I experienced it throughout my life. The blatant openness of racism, the resurgence of racism, uh, xenophobia, and, and all these issues that we suffer under the Trump uh, administration, uh, that prompted me more than anything else to see the level of violence that uh, people were willing to commit openly. I see so much that uh, reflects that era that I grew up in, and I felt like it was it would be a good thing just to be prepared to defend my community and my family. It is just a very capable and efficient weapon. When we see the militias and that kind of thing, we understand that the grade of their weapons are military grade weapons. Uh, so you fight fire with fire. What do you think when you listen to that argument, Director? Um, look, let me just frame this with a couple different things. First of all, uh, in this country, uh, you know, we have a constitution. The constitution does guarantee the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, and we have to respect that, right? That's part of who, who uh, we are as lawyers, as law enforcers. We take the law, as I said, as I found it. In terms of the, the, the questions you asked about the, the assault weapons ban, uh, to be very clear, right, it is Congress who will decide uh, whether to take that issue up. And if they do take it up and they want um, technical expert advice uh, on weapons, uh, ATF is willing to provide and will provide any member with, with our technical expertise on these questions. Um, now, going to the specific video that you showed me, you know, uh, uh, I uh, think it's important to say that uh, the level of uh, violent extremism in this country is very significant right now. And I, I say that not just as a person who's a law enforcer, but as a very proud Jewish American, um, that there are uh, threats of people who are uh, not just espousing extreme views, but are actually violently uh, acting in addition. And ATF has always been there to try and help and support uh, those communities and to catch people uh, who are uh, planning to commit those kinds of acts of violence. And we always will be, along with the FBI, of course, and all our other partners. Um, so, you know, uh, People are allowed to have firearms for self-defense, uh, but hopefully we can live in a country where law enforcement and the greater community uh, can protect people from violence 
and I just leave them to their to the to their own, uh, you know, to their own devices to protect themselves. Right? That's the role of law enforcement is to try and protect people. So, uh, it, the problem that the the video that the person described, I'm very very sympathetic to, uh, um, and uh, you know, as ATF director, so I came here. Right? We we do what we can every single day to try and protect people who are vulnerable. You mentioned you talked about violent extremism. There's also a lot of political violence as well. Um, we know that the former president is going to be arraigned tomorrow. Um, there have been some calls for protests outside of that Manhattan court or in New York City. Are you hearing anything that is concerning? And does ATF have any sort of role in monitoring or responding to that situation? Should there be well, one? Well, first of all, First of all, with respect to the the entire issue of uh, of the former president, ATF has no role, uh, and I am not involved or have any special information that the other people don't have. Um, any crime that anybody commits, uh, it's a crime of violence, I suppose, ATF uh, would be involved. But I think the broader point that I just want to say, which actually goes to both your last questions, is, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to live in a, in a country of laws where people respect the law and don't, uh, don't engage in violent activities because they disagree with something that's going on. Um, and, uh, and also that it's not, you know, the Wild West where everybody just takes it upon themselves uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that they respond to violence, perhaps violently. I, I really hope that doesn't happen. As yeah. somebody in law enforcement, it doesn't uh, help law enforcement at all. It doesn't protect the public uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And, and um, I just really, you know, appeal to everybody. You know, things, things, and things are, are at very high temperature now. You know, I wasn't, you know, and, and especially, you know, you talk about the area I work in is one of the areas where the temperature is so high. Everybody ascribes to everybody else, you know, horrible motives and there's a lot of, of very heated rhetoric and uh, I hope you now I was in St. Louis this week with the, doing an event with with the National Shooting Sports Foundation right that's mm -hmm. the, the organization that that represents the gun industry it was about educating firearms dealers to not allow straw purchases to happen right so we found yeah. something to work on together to help protect people maybe maybe there's a lot of disagreement between different groups of people. But my hope, my hope is, is that we can keep things calm and lower the temperature uh, and try to work on solutions together. That's why, that's why I came to government. I think it's hopefully why everybody comes to government. You know, it's certainly, you know, not to, you know, enrich oneself, right? It's to, it's, it's to try and come up with solutions to hard problems. Look, we've got a real yeah. hard one in my building, in my building, mm -hmm. violent but, crime. Right. Um, we're almost out of time, but I have a couple more questions for you. One is my colleagues at The Post, they wrote a story about how um, the uh, in Washington, D.C., they are not prosecuting uh, gun possession crimes, that, that that prosecution has dropped dramatically. What is your response to that, and is that a problem? Do, does local law enforcement need to, to prosecute um, gun possessions? So one of the real, so I'm a former prosecutor, I'm a recovering prosecutor myself, right? I was the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Ohio for close to seven years and a career prosecutor for uh, almost 15 years before that. Uh, one of the difficult things about violent crime uh, that I've discovered over the years and in this job is violent crime looks very different in different parts of this country and gun crime in particular. Uh, and so, you know, you might have some types of crime that you can sort of have a, a, a one approach to everywhere. Uh, I found that in violent crime, that is not the case. So my basic sort of approach on these things is I, I generally start from the proposition that the people who live in an area who are responsible for law enforcement in that area probably have the best handle on how to meet their violent crime problem. Nobody's in favor of violent crime. I, I don't care what party you're in. I don't care what your beliefs are on any issue, including firearms. I, nobody's in favor of violent crime. People have different approaches. And so I don't know nearly enough about the problem in the District of Columbia uh, to be able to tell you what the best approach in that area is. 
uh, you know, as ATF director, I tell people in local law enforcement, ATF, we're the partner you want, uh, which is meant to all, first of all, we want to be your partner, but second of all, we want to be flexible to deal with the threat as you face it. So, you know, if you're in Mobile, Alabama, or, uh, you know, or Denver, or, you know, whatever, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, whatever it is, your problem's going to look different than Washington. Yeah. It just is, just the way things work. So I really do think that people have to start with the notion that state and local law enforcement accountable to their state and local citizens, right, are probably, I presume that they know what they're doing. Is it, it you know, so, so so that's, I guess, my best answer to your question, which is I, yeah. I, I presume they know what they're doing in D.C. because they're trying hard to stop violent crime. Great. And we are out of time, but I have one yes or no question that I have to ask you. It's something that I've written about uh, over the years. Um, and that is, do gun records need to be digitized? They are currently paper copies at ATF. Does that system need to change? And will it? That, that is that is not a yes or no question. It's a, <laughs> it's a complicated question. Uh, we we need modernization at the National uh, Tracing Center. There are mm -hmm. some restrictions that Congress has passed yeah. uh, on how we can store and keep records. Uh, the idea behind these restrictions is, again, not to have a national firearms registry. Uh, and so we will work within those restrictions as best we can. But I, I will tell you, uh, it, it, it does, it, it creates a challenge for us. We have every, uh, every month 1.8 million uh, paper records come in to uh, to our uh, our national processing center uh, because we store the out of business records and uh, there are a group of people who I've visited up there in West Virginia who are literally taking them out of boxes you know one by one and flattening them and scanning them so that they can be scanned uh, so so they do get uh, scanned into electronic format but but we don't uh, have the search functions that other people do for the reasons you mentioned. So, you know, this is a challenge. We will, we still, by the way, we are still able to turn around traces. We spend a lot of money on it and resources and a lot of people uh, have to run into boxes and which, which is very hard on a very quick timeline. Uh, we will do the best with what we can with the rules that Congress sets for us to try and turn that trace around so that we can catch that Highland Park 4th of July shooter before he shoots again up in Wisconsin. Seems from an outsider like the process is created to move very slowly and very difficulty, difficult, difficultly, um, if that's a word. So anyway, uh, Director Dettelbach, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I have like 5,000 more questions for you, but we've gone over time. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for watching. Uh, please visit WashingtonPostLive.com for a review of this program and for our future programs. See you next time.